So without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, the Honorable Dr. John Hagee, Minister of Health and Community Services at the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador. Minister Hagee will present on the Department's perspective on health care, challenges and potential solutions. Dr. Hagee. Good morning. First after breakfast, I'm not sure whether I'm on the menu or uh, uh, just simply the warm-up act for everybody else. Um, uh, it's great to be here and, and I will have to apologize in advance because uh, the House of Assembly now with its uh, family-friendly hours will open at uh, 10 o'clock and uh, I have a legal and legislative responsibility to be in my seat on time. So uh, unlike some surgeons, I will have to turn up on time for that. So um, my... <laughs> My, my staff will be, uh, will be here for the rest of the day, taking notes and uh, be the moles in the house. The theme today is uh, addressing health outcomes and costs. So I've come to an economics forum with one slide and no numbers. Um, I think everybody here knows the challenges. Uh, and I've been very much focused on solutions to those challenges, and so is my department. And that's the task before me as minister, for us as healthcare professionals uh, and folk interested in the future of healthcare in the province, is to find sustainable solutions uh, for the health needs of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Uh, to do this, uh, we have anchored our work on the basis of this graphic behind us, which is the triple aim. And for those of you who've been around healthcare and healthcare economics for a length of time, this is actually old school thinking in many respects, but it's just as valid today as it was 20, 30 years ago when Don Berwick and the, the folk at um, uh, IHI came up with it. The concept originally was a three-legged stool. And the idea of that is you can't soar anything off one leg and keep it balanced. You have to make some kind of uh, balanced approach between these three limbs. And essentially, it is better care for the individual, better health for the population, and better value for the dollars that are spent out of the public purse. So at the heart of our uh, government philosophy, my mandate is the mantra of better care through better management. We need to bring about some lasting change. We need to move from where we were to where we need to go. Uh, and it looks at health in general, uh, a, a comment referenced in, in the opening by Dr. Gambin, not just healthcare. So we need to, to do things differently. We need to look at ideas, uh, both from policy and from the grassroots. We've got to change, uh, and we've got to do it in a way that makes sense. As Dr. Gambin pointed out, on a per capita basis, this province spends more than any other province. We don't actually spend more than any of the territories. And the one comment I'd leave you with is that once you get west of Fairhaven, our population distribution is that of a territory, not a province. We are little different, particularly in Labrador. We're actually more sparsely populated than none of it. So that needs to be factored into our thinking. But irrespective of that, if you look at the money we spend per capita, our health care outcomes are no better than any other jurisdictions. And in some areas, our health indicators are actually worse. Healthcare accounts currently for anywhere between 38 and 40% of the provincial spend. Depends on how you calculate it, depends on the year. Looking at the trend, however, what's happened is uh, since 2001, where we spent 1.3 billion in the fiscal year on health, to last year where the ask was approximately 3 billion. That's a 130% increase in 16 years. So the task that I've had in the last two and a bit, 27 months, uh, someone pointed out to me uh, that I am actually now the third longest serving health minister in Canada. Uh, and as of Friday or Saturday, I may actually be the longest serving health minister since John Collins uh, in this province. Um, we have been working hard to try and make things sustainable. What we have done at a, just a macro level is we've kept healthcare spending static for three fiscal years. 
That is not a mean feat when you think of inflationary pressures, CPI, and the escalating demand that's been referred to in the opening comments. One of the interesting things that popped out uh, uh, of our initial assessment when I took office was areas of cost pressure. The demand for long-term care beds for the aging population was the immediate pressure point, and I'll reference that a little bit later. Aging infrastructure we've heard about uh, lately. Um, but one of the fastest growing areas, even though it isn't numerically the largest at the moment, is the whole issue of drug expenditure. And that's why last week, when the federal government came out with this announcement on Tuesday that there would be a national pharmacare program, uh, it was really of interest to us, particularly with an aging demographic and a lot of people with uh, not just single chronic diseases, but multiple chronic diseases. Uh, it's been something of a movable feast since Tuesday afternoon, because every time I open the newspaper, the whole thing has changed slightly. Um, both the Premier and I have actually opened a dialogue with um, uh, Mr. Morneau, uh, Dr. Hoskins, and uh, Minister Pettipar taylor to try and get some clarity around what the, the federal government's proposal actually is because there is certainly a lot of economic evidence that there is work to be done on a national formulary, on a, a national pharmacare that isn't just a, a, a sort of spackle on the gaps kind of approach. Um, we've actually been working as a province with the uh, Federal and Provincial Territorial Committee on uh, a, a national formulary approach. Uh, we are probably further along than some areas because as a, an Atlantic group, the Atlantic premiers and Atlantic health ministers have actually uh, gone fairly far down the road of looking at an Atlantic formulary, uh, regardless of what the, province, the, the other provinces were doing on a national scale. Um, so again, I think just that one idea around pharmacare issue relates to the levels of involvement in healthcare. Uh, and I can wax lyrical about the uh, Canada health transfer and how it's changed over the years. And now the feds only pay 17% of a budget that they once spent 50% of our dollars on. So I'll leave that for another time because really I think it detracts from some of the more granular issues here. If you look at outcomes, we need to look at outcomes because at the end of the day, um, without some data, you, you, uh, you haven't got a target to aim at. Um, Dr. Gambin made a very astute observation. In actual fact, if you want to look at health costs in this province, our spending is minute. We spend $60 million a year on health. The other $2.4 billion is on illness. We don't have the accent right there looking at it on a longer term. We got the highest rates of chronic disease in the country for certain conditions, 62% of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have at least one chronic condition, such as arthritis or diabetes or heart disease, the national average is 53%. 38% of us have two chronic conditions, compared with other Canadians at 29%. So one of the, the measures that we've already put in place, again, not very glamorous, but crucial, is a chronic disease action plan we have enshrined through NLCHI a chronic disease registry, not a database, a registry. And that difference is important. The first limb of that, the first piece of that, is a diabetes registry. A registry is like a telephone. A database is like an answering machine. The registry allows you to go out and proactively look for people who haven't had their interventions that we know on evidence make a difference. Have you had your eye check each year? Have you had foot care? Have you had uh, appropriate blood work done? And I know Dr. Parfrey has uh, a, a small uh, volume of, of initiatives uh, through his uh, Choosing Wisely campaign in Newfoundland and Labrador that will make significant differences in what's relevant and what's not. And that's another limb, and I'll come back to that later. So the key solution to health is not actually within the Department of Health. If you look at uh, the Hall report from the 60s, Lalonde in the 70s, 50 plus years of reports have shown very clearly 
that the bulk of a person's health is actually related to things outside health. Uh, it's related to things like education, it's related to income, it's related to housing. Um, an anecdote from a different environment. Tuberculosis incidents in Manchester, in England, where I grew up, started to fall in the 1920s. Streptomycin, the antibiotic used to treat tuberculosis in the first years, did not come on the market for another 25 years. The reason was social housing. You got rid of the, the, the overcrowded tenements and you built the coronation streets of the world. And that was the biggest single public health maneuver in terms of tuberculosis. So if you then look at a proxy, if you look at uh, an indicator of um, family income at birth, if you look at life expectancy, then Canadians vary very little across top and bottom centiles. Top centile of family income, life expectancy is now around 81, 82. Bottom, it's around 79, not much of a difference. You dwell down and dig down into that and you'll find there's an indicator called disease-free life expectancy. How long you can expect to live before you get a chronic condition? If you look at the top centile, that's 77 years. So you've got maybe three or four years with chronic disease at the most. You look at the bottom centile, disease-free life expectancy is 52 years. You've got a quarter of a century with chronic disease. Nothing to do with health. All to do with your family's income at birth. So we have started with a thing called health in all policies. Not a very glamorous thing. Not, didn't pick up much on the radar because it was quietly done through the backroom machinery of government. But basically what that is is a policy unit now so that any policy that goes to cabinet goes through a health lens. They're currently seized with the Municipalities Act. What percentage of green space should you have in your community? How many walking areas should you have in your community? What about bicycle lanes? These kind of things will not produce a benefit today or tomorrow. But in five years, the incidence of pulmonary disease will start to fall. The incidence of vehicular accidents will go down. And in 20 years, you'll have a more active population. We've looked at health as a lens through which we must judge every policy. It will ultimately reduce the reliance on illness and it will ultimately reduce direct health care costs. I reference this slide at the back. It's my only slide. It's the only principle you need to know as far as I'm concerned when you look at health care. But better care through better management is the phrase, a catchphrase, a slogan, a soundbite I can use in the elevator when someone says, you know, what are you doing in health? Our system was never designed, it evolved. You had a, a natural resource, the fish. You brought them into a harbor, you built a community that then became a year round. And what did you do? You put a church, a school, and you got a doctor. And nothing changed after that. Nothing much changed. You still go around now and there are small communities that are worried because they've lost their doctor. Because instead of having 5,000 people in an active fishery or an active local resource, they're down to 350 or 400 people, but they still want the doctor. Healthcare infrastructure was built at a time when that population distribution existed. Our demographics have shifted. We have the fastest aging population in Canada very soon, 25% of our population will be over 65. The communities, uh, smaller communities, there's been a migration. Gander's population went up by over 20% in the last uh, two census. Uh, and most of that was migration of seniors who are coming in for services from Ladle Cove, from Carmenville, from New West Valley, around that area, because it's easier for them in the winter to access it. There is a rudimentary public transport system called a cab company. There's nothing out and about elsewhere. So um, we've got to deal with that legacy. And I promise former Minister Wiseman that I would not blame him for any of the actions of previous government that have sat at the back. Because, you know, it, it's the boiling frog scenario. You put a frog in water and heat it up and it won't jump out. You drop it in boiling water, it leaps out. It creeps up on you over time. So our healthcare system doesn't reflect the current realities of today. So we're focused on that idea of better management. 
So what does that mean in tangible terms? It's all right with these big principle things. But the center of excellence now can no longer be a shiny building on a hill or a faded building downtown. It's got to be moved out. The center of excellence from a clinical perspective has to be the home. It has to be the community and a hospital only when that level of care will not meet the needs of the individual. So we need to build up and fortify what we've called primary health care within the communities. We've got then to redesign the delivery of healthcare services for a community setting and not just an institutional one. And the problems you hear about in the acute care centers, their solutions by and large lie in the community. Their solutions will be generated from changes that we see in the community. We have a huge geography, but we have ways of defeating that geography by using technology. You're live streaming this here today. So you can watch it in St. Anthony, you can watch it in Makovic or Forto. You don't need to be in this room and yet you get the benefits, if that's the right word, of listening to folks such as myself or perhaps the, 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 uh, the healthcare providers will be of more interest to you. Um, we need to match the infrastructure to the population and its needs. We have a huge resource in a highly skilled workforce and the challenge there is best expressed in one phrase, which is scopes of practice. And it slides off the tongue and nobody really notices it until you realize that that is the single biggest source of friction lately. It's the interface between different skill sets and where they overlap. So it's physicians and nurse practitioners, it's pharmacists and physicians, it's RNs and LPNs, it's LPNs and PCAs. And every time a quote is made, about that friction, it generates heat. But we've got to have those discussions and we've got to sit down and we've got to take it away from um, the, the kind of entrenched, almost defensive attitudes about it. It's got to be about the patient at the end of the day. Because if you focus there, you will fail less often than if you focus on the provider. So we need to redesign our service delivery. We've looked at long-term care We've looked at acute care services, but the key pressure point when I came into office was mental health and addictions. It has been the Cinderella of healthcare for too long. And if you look at mental health itself, addictions has been the poor cousin of Cinderella. It really just has not had any kind of attention that it needed. And we've seen the results of that. And we continue to see the results of that. And my buddy Tree is somewhere in here and she never fails to take an opportunity to remind me of what we haven't done and what we've not done. But I'll go down this a little bit and I'll come back and I'll tell you what we have done because the landscape today is different than it was two or three years ago. We've placed a spotlight on this because we needed to. This was the pressure point. The bar's been set high. And one of the things we need to do to help address mental health and addictions is to break down the sh simple stigma that you hear around those topics. Nobody wants to talk about it. I was at a forum yesterday around that issue. It reminds me very much of when I was a medical student and then a resident, when no one would talk about cancer. Nobody wanted to mention it. It was the dreaded word. It was in a closet too. We've dragged that out and now you have people rowing for uh, survivorship. We talk about people who've been through it uh, and their advocates for themselves and supports for people who've not quite made that journey. We need to do that for mental health and we can do it and we've started that progress. So the awareness piece is out there. But to speak of the community and low barriers and access, Doorways is a program that's rolled out over the course of the last 18 months, certainly over the last year. It's a single session, drop in, no appointment counseling service. And we know from our experiences when we've put that in place, 50% of the people who walk through that door at the end of that hour have their issues dealt with. They're good to go and they're back out in the community. Low barrier, low intensity, low tech. For those people, for example, for whom that isn't enough, the next step we put in place, again, uses technology to defeat geography. You have therapist assistance online. It's basically a therapeutic relationship to which you are referred and it can be done by phone, it can be done by Skype, it can be done by email or a combination of those and is a short, 
six-session counseling session. We've got capacity to put 18,000 people into that this year alone, if that's what's needed. And if we need more, we can get more. But that makes that as accessible in Goose Bay or Makovic as it is in downtown St. John's. There's no, um, there's no barrier to the doorways, and then you start to climb up what we've called a stepped care approach in uh, healthcare. Second step I've alluded to, third and fourth steps are for those people with increasing complexity of mental health issues. But we know perfectly well from figures that you may actually only need the services of a psychiatrist for about 15-ish percent of people with mental health issues. That kind of top, difficult, complex 15%. But you don't need to have everybody waiting for that level of service. You match the service to the demand. We've also partnered with the Mental Health Council of Canada. Louise Bradley, an expat RN from the Waterford, who's now the CEO of the Mental Health Council of Canada, came to the Burin and started Roots of Hope. It's a community-based suicide prevention project. It increases awareness, it puts feet on the ground, and it involves the communities. And there is a very active community group now in Burin, and there's even a youth group who are determined to try and bring these issues out of the closet and simply get people talking about suicide. We have the plan, we released it last June, the implementation plan for mental health towards recovery. And the title says it all. Embedded in there, and a key element, is around the Waterford Hospital. That was built when the Crimean War was still the news of the day. 1855, Victoria was on the throne. People with mental health issues were put in a hospital and kept there because that was all they could do. Uh, that is literally ancient history. We have got to change from an institution-based care model to a community care model. What we're doing now is building the community piece so that in the coming weeks, we'll be ready to announce what the new Waterford will look like uh, and how we will go out and build that. We need to focus on the community, but we also have to accept that there are some folk for whom period of, in, of, of hospital care is necessary and maybe uh, a period of prolonged supervision is necessary and we need to build that. So it's the right care in the right place at the right time by the right folk. We've got other areas of service redesign and I've only got 30 minutes to allow some time for questions which I'd love to, love to deal with. So home first, that's our next area. We have this aging population, the home first initiative focused on seniors needs aiming to keep them in their homes supported as long as we can. We have an integrated child health services model coming. That's in response to both the Towards Recovery Report and the Premier's Task Force on Educational Outcomes. We have had this huge debate about whether or not we're small enough that we should have one regional health authority. But I'll suggest this to you. In those provinces that have done that, it's smoke and mirrors. Everybody has spent so much time trying to figure out what the reorganization means that no one has noticed what was going on in the back rooms. No one has noticed the health care, and it's cost a boatload of money. And the province that led the way is now going to zones with autonomy to deliver services in their own area with local input. What do you call those? I could call them zones if you want, if it makes you feel happier. Uh, change the name and keep, keep the back room the same. It's even cheaper. We've done a different thing. We've said, what do we do as shared services across the RHAs that make sense? So we have taken out purchasing and inventory and stock control virtually. We've not moved anybody. We've taken those areas out, and now we can purchase as a province. We have Health Pro, but we have 400,000 items in our stock dictionary for healthcare institutions, but they're in 4,000 categories. Do you need? A hundred different styles of Band-Aids? No. Okay? You may need two or three. You may need four or five. That's where you're going to see the savings. You're going to stop carrying this stuff on the shelf. You're going to stop throwing it away before you use it. We've done the same thing very recently with IT and uh, the Newfoundland and Labrador Centre for Health Information. 
It was one of the first of its kind in the country. It's a leader. We're going to put it back there and make sure everybody damn well knows about it because that will be the place that will look after IT for healthcare for the RHAs and the community across the province. Single point of contact, networking, it can be done virtually, it can be done by someone in Port Basque, just as well as it can be done by someone in an office in St. John's. We're looking at primary health care, and I alluded to that, and these are clinical areas of, of interest, um, maybe not so much to the economists, but they do have uh, significant impact because we've seen successes in Burin, Bonavista, Central, Greater St. John's, downtown, and we're moving on the West Coast. Each team, though, is tailored to the needs of the geography it serves. So the downtown team, with its emphasis on homelessness and addictions, will have a different staff and a different complement than maybe on the West Coast, where aging and diabetes is relevant. So we have built on the EMR and the EHR to try and connect all these so they're all integrated, because that's the other piece. So basically, our healthcare system can and must be transformed. The first step with any problem is realizing that you can fix it. Because if you don't, you throw your hands up and walk away. We've got to look at the overuse and inappropriate use. And I'm delighted to see Pat's got as long as me to talk about that area because it's an area that's close to my heart. We've got to coordinate specialist services and deal with wait times. But we can do that by getting the community piece right so the hospitals are less stressed. We use technology. We have remote patient monitoring programs now, not pilots, programs. We have uh, investments proposed in infrastructure. We've sorted out long-term care for the moment in Cornerbrook. We're going ahead with acute care in Cornerbrook. We have long-term care beds coming in Gander. We have long-term care beds coming in Grand Falls. We have capacity increases in Carbonear and Botwood, which is a center of excellence for neurocognitive disorders. And nobody knew about that. It teaches, it's the only place in the province that teaches family medicine residents for a third year in neurocognitive issues. We know there's gonna be increasing demands. But we know that there are efficiencies within the system that we can use to meet those. And we can live within our budget. We have shown that we can do that. Our curve is no longer a curve, it's flat. We're still spending higher than the national average. Throwing money at this program has never worked. It never worked. No good crisis should go to waste. We have a fiscal issue. We get better value out of our system. We use that crisis to deal with the problem because without that lever, we're just gonna sit there and spend more. We don't have that luxury now, so the changes are coming. We have an individual responsibility though to look after our own personal health. I can't legislate that. That's health in all policies. That's a cultural societal issue. It's great to see this mix of people here today, healthcare providers, patient groups, but I'm just going to wrap up on some positive notes because everyone thinks it's doom and gloom. Gary said it. We have an excellent medical school. It's a world leader in areas. We have an excellent school of nursing. It's a world leader in areas. We have an excellent pharmacy school building on now a new doctorate program. We have a workforce that is skilled and if let off the leash to do what they were trained to do, will answer significant delivery problems. So I'm keen to hear what comes out of the rest of today. Uh, as I say, I, I have a legislative legal responsibility to be somewhere else in 57 minutes. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave you on that. As my granny would say, I gotta love you and leave you. But um, <laughs> I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, I think there's time, I've been given the five minute warning. So I think that's five minutes of speaking, not questions. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Haggy. That was great and great timekeeping on your part as well. And you won't run off until we get some questions in. Okay, so if you have a question for Minister Haggy, um, you can put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. And please make sure we do. We've got one over here. And okay. Dr. Haggy, I enjoy that very much. Thank you. Um, what do you see or what are your thoughts around what indicators we should use for our population health? I mean, Kaihaia as an administrative database, of course, is confounded. 
Lots of jurisdictions have struggled with this throughout North America and the world. But I agree from a, a patient's perspective. I want to know that my health you know, is being determined correctly or that, that the indicators, I can look at the indicators and see that when I go into that health infrastructure, it's doing a good job. Like, What should we use? What report card should we generate? That's a very interesting question. And it's somewhat kind of technical. But at the end of the day, the only safe spot is to avoid using surrogate outcomes. You've got to have something that makes sense. Uh, and that end becomes almost a matter of judgment. Um, with an elderly group of patients, is prolonging life for three months the important indicator? Or is how that life is lived for what time is left a better one? And if it becomes how that life is lived, one of the challenges in, in, in primary care, as I understand it, is you have people with three or four chronic diseases and the treatment of one chronic disease directly exacerbates another. What matters more to the individual as they age? Is it that they live for their quilting so they need the sensation in their fingers? Or is it an issue of mobility uh, because their breathing is, is awkward? And, and when you get down to that individual level, it becomes very difficult. I think what we have to do nationally, and we, we've done some work on this through the FPT group, is to agree what makes sense from a systems point of view. And the economists, the health economists amongst us, will use a different lens. They'll try and quantify it through quality-adjusted life years and these kind of things. Um, but I think I would flip it back and say, you're the clinician, you deal with cardiac issues, what indicators make sense to you? And we have that discussion and we figure out a way of measuring it. But with the technology now being more centralized, we have the ability to do that, make it real time and make it a decision support tool. Thank you. We had another question, the lady with the green lanyard. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Sri Mule. I'm here in the Community Health and Humanities Division in the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, last week, I was in Ottawa with the Canadian Health Coalition, and the, we met with the four of the Newfoundland centers. There were four of us from the province. And one of the issues, the main issue that was undertaken was the whole question of privatization. I know that you have spoken about it, but I wonder if you would like to elaborate a little bit on the whole issue of how we should deal with privatization in this province because there are a number of uh, services that come under that and some which are paid for by the province, but uh, there was a concern that there was perhaps some double billing or uh, excess billing for certain procedures. I think that that's an apparently simple question. With, it's like an onion. You know, you, you, you take the first layer off, there's another layer underneath and the process of taking the layer off makes you cry. Um, <laughs> the, the bottom line there is really, we have a publicly funded system. It was established with some federal guidelines. And at the time, the feds put in half the dollars. Uh, it was based on hospital delivered and uh, physician delivered services. And that was the model very much actually they inherited from the 40s and before. The idea of the, the, the system then was to return often young people uh, with an acute problem back to tax paying status. Now what's happened is we have an aging population and a different demographic. Public funding is still there. It's enshrined in the five principles of Medicare. I think if you look at, uh, uh, from the bottom, we are actually already in, in a mix. It's publicly funded, but I would suggest to you a lot of physician services are actually private de privately delivered because they are self-employed business people in their own offices. I would go back to the previous question and say, well, what are the outcomes? What are the gains? You know, if, if there's a profit to be had, should that profit from public funds not go to the benefit of the public? How is that fairly divided? Because the laborer is worthy of his hire. Uh, I don't have the answer to that because some of the other parts of that question is what's insured and what's not. The Canada Health Act was written at a time when nobody envisaged some procedures even being possible. Uh, and that technology piece has escalated to the point where they're really outside of what the Canada Health Act uh, uh, considered. What's a lifestyle procedure and what's a medically necessary procedure? Because that's what's written in the health, 
the, the Canada Health Act, and that's what's enshrined in our uh, Hospital and, and Healthcare Insurance Act. So that's a discussion as much for society as it is for me. Not to, to dodge the question, but on a very practical, strategic level, I have to answer the question of, is it value for money? And is this solution to today's problem going to be tomorrow's problem? Because a lot of the problems that we have today were actually, 20 years ago, a solution. Uh, we put an institution and a service there, and it fixed a problem. And now, with the change in the environment around that, that fix has become a problem we need to solve today. For example, the institutionalization of, of, medical, of, of mental health issues, for example. At one time, nobody knew what to do with folk. There was not the, the, the chemical uh, imbalance hypothesis. There was not the medications to do it. So people with behavioral issues, rather than being medicated, because that wasn't an option, were put in institutional settings. Now, that's a problem because we have other options. So I think we've got to keep looking at the problem, quite frankly. We've got to look at what outcomes we want, and we've got to look at what the cost is, both in financial and society terms. Vague, I know, but, uh, you know, it's not a problem for which there is a clear answer, and I'm a great fan of Mencken, you know. For every complex problem, there is an immediately obvious simple solution, which is invariably wrong. Okay. Uh, I, you're keeping track of time, are you? Yes, I am. I'm kind yep. of spotting here. Okay. We should be able to get another couple of questions in. So the gentleman in the red sweater, and then we had the gentleman in the black jacket after him. Okay. In the back. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you for uh, your presentation. You've got a big job in front of you. Uh, I like your approach, and I wish you luck. <laughs> thank you. There are some uh, days I feel I need it, <laughs> more than others. Um, I, we just had, um, our family just had sort of a, a bit of experience with the Ontario health care system with the Princess Margaret uh, Cancer Centre. And something that they do there that I see transcends a lot of issues and would support some of the things that you're trying to do in terms of putting increased responsibility and, uh, and ownership of people's health status and, and their things that they do. And it's a system called a portal system whereby somebody comes into the hospital, is a client of the hospital, they sign up to basically receive through emails, notices when things are done, proceed, you know, when tests are done, and actually you can access your test results, you can access all kinds of information, and the doctor basically takes the time to explain what's important in terms of the factors at play, and when you receive the notices of your results, the results are your results, and then there's also sort of like some sort of a continuum there of to what's normal, what's abnormal, or what have you. So. Uh, when you uh, go in, uh, and it works really quickly, really fast, very efficiently, like when you go in for a result, uh, go in for a test in the morning, like say some blood work, before you get upstairs almost, before you get to your appointment, you've got the test result. And so when you go into the doctor or to the clinic or whoever it is you're seeing, it's not about what did the test result say, it's about what do you think of the test result and now where do you go from here? And, and even if you didn't do that, there's been times when we haven't seen anybody because we didn't need to, because we knew where the values were going to fall, so wait till next week. So to me, uh, it just seems like such a great system and a way for people to participate more in their, in their, own, in their own monitoring their health and stuff and, and stuff like that. Do you think, you know, are we, are we close to doing something like that here? Or? The short answer is not quite. Okay. Um, the bottom line is, um, I mean, Nova Scotia has just moved to that. The key is backroom architecture. Uh, the, the hardware and some of the software that we run healthcare on is 30 years old. It didn't exist. The internet was, was still ARPANET in those days. Uh, it, it didn't exist. Our challenge is to, to uh, enable NLCHI to evergreen our backbone because the, the newer gear, the lab gear and, and, and that kind of thing is all there and geared up to put that into a system. But at the moment, that box doesn't work the way you've described in Ontario. Uh, and we have cost estimates varying from 50 to 150 million to remedy that IT infrastructure deficit. So the short answer is we've, we've taken pieces of that. Uh, and for example, Hacking Health uh, this weekend, uh, 
is, is a forum where some of those problems will come up. But the last one was around something simple like wait times for blood draw clinics in St. John's. You could go on the app they developed, the, these teams, and you could see where the wait time for a blood draw for your blood work was the shortest. So they're taking bite-sized chunks of that. And by the time we get the system to a stage where you can do that, there are people in this room who probably tell you better whether we will go to a portal like that or an app on your phone or some hybrid mix, because quite frankly, that's changing already. And I think one of the challenges is, you know, trying to build a system that has some durability into it. But I, I agree. I mean, patient ownership of their healthcare information as a principle is something I, I'm all in favor of. And I think that's the big strategic principle behind what you talk about. Because if you've got the information at your hand and how we provide that in a sense is, is, is something I'll leave to what I lovingly call my geeks, but please don't take offense at that. Um, then, you know, I think it's a great idea. Preaching to the choir. We had a question in the back down here. Lillian, if you could get that. There we go. Enjoyed your, uh, your presentation. I'm, I'm back here. Oh, right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Steve Tomlin, Political Science Department. Um, we're working with Romano. Uh, we're looking at the issue of health care reform and why is it so difficult. And you highlighted the problems of path dependencies. And, and you talked about the power of ideas and the, the importance in terms of driving new ideas. But you also talked about some of the institutional constraints and some of the constraints associated with the interests which have power as well. So when we're looking at Romano, we're looking at the three eyes. You know, where is power located? Where do we want it uh, to be located? So the first one's kind of an empirical question. The other one's more, more normative. Um, so, so I guess the, the question is, why has it been so difficult um, if we know the system is not producing the outcomes, if the costs are very high, uh, what kind of changes are necessary or required, both within, obviously within the institutions of your interests, or even in terms of what kind of knowledge networks, what kind of knowledge resources that don't have power uh, currently, because we know a lot about this in terms of many of these ideas have been around for a long, long period of time, but what needs to be done in order to strengthen those ideas, push those ideas, make them more dominant ideas, and again, a lot of that has to do with understanding the, the interplay between the institutions, the interests, and the ideas which have been uh, inherited from the past. I mean, I, I think from my point of view, that a lot of it is, is habit. Um, a lot of it is, is kind of culture. And as some famous business guy once said, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, I, I think uh, one of the best answers is, is, is to give you an example. And I think Pat, Pat's project around choosing wisely is an interesting one. How do you change behavior in a disparate group of people who have almost individual level autonomy. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a change management piece. Uh, I, as a politician, walk uh, in a slightly ambiguous world. Um, I'm, I'm more like the president than the CEO, the deputy minister I regard as the, the CEO. Uh, my job is to kind of set strategy and see what levers I can use to bring groups to bear. But, uh, you know, going to war is never uh, a good way of solving a problem, except when you really have no alternative. And if you do, you still need an exit strategy. You still need a peace treaty in your back pocket um, uh, if you go that route. But it's far better to try and bring people in and say, what is it that's stopping you from seeing the merit of that argument? And sometimes they have a good counter argument because, as I say, what looks to you to be an immediately simple solution to a problem may actually have unintended consequences in one direction or another. Um, it's a negotiation. The whole business of managing healthcare at my level is a negotiation. There are groups who will feel that we're not doing enough and that we need to go in a certain direction. They have a constituency. They have a, uh, a public voice. And there are other groups that... Uh, have the ability to say no to that, either directly or worse still, smile and nod and then do nothing. Uh, and it can be a real challenge. Uh, I don't have an easy answer. You as an academic might have some research that will tell me what I can do to make it better. And if you do, my door's open and I'll give you my phone number before I go. <laughs>
Okay, we've only got two minutes left, so if it's a very quick question, we've got down in the back, a very quick question and a quick answer, and it could be discussed later. A quick answer from a politician. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. I hope. Uh, my name is Sudhi Saha. I'm one of those uh, retired faculty members from Man who cannot stay home. So here I am. I'm here as a patient, and I want to uh, uh, react to the idea. You said that uh, healthcare will be served from co uh, hospital to community. I have an idea. I would like to say that from community to the individual. There was a doctor in this province who gave me a piece of paper about 25 years ago. And by the way, I have three chronic disease because I'm one of those cases. <laughs> What he said, that every time you see a doctor or go to a lab or wherever, whatever they say, you record here, which I've been doing. And uh, it has helped me a, a great deal. And as I said, I'm here as a patient to uh, talk about this healthcare. So I think we should encourage each patient, uh, you can also make it mandatory, give them a piece of paper. <coughs> and actually tr they better track their own health. So from uh, hospital to community to individual, the focus should be on the individual because he is in control, he or she is in control of his health. What do you think about this? I, I think if you read the introduction to Towards Recovery, it says that this system for mental health uh, and addiction should be person-centered, uh, and you have really just spoken in a way to the issue of ownership of a health record. You've essentially created your own version of a health record viewed from your perspective. I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, it would be um, not a difficult thing, I don't think, to actually incorporate that into an electronic or a digital form. Uh, really, uh, you know, I use community as a shorthand for a group of individuals. Uh, and I did mention, you know, personal responsibility earlier on. Uh, I, I don't emphasize that too much because, in a sense, I take it as background predication, a foundational piece. Uh, and maybe I should be a bit more uh, overt in stating it. But from where I, I stand, my, my issues relate to some of Dr. Tomlin's concerns about, you know, groups and, and how you how you manage people collectively uh, in terms of their expectations and their input and this kind of thing. But I mean, I think basically you have spoken to the idea of having your own health record, and I support it. Okay, thank you, Minister Hange. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you.